Carpetbaggers by Kovax. Chapter 4 Did humans live in Narnia before the witch came, Rhea? Edmund asked. They had been walking since late morning, following the course of a stream west and north across a wide valley. This area was sprightly wooded, although Lucy could see a dense forest on the hills ahead of them. A gust of wind rattled the shrubs along the banks of the stream. Yesterday's rain had stopped by nightfall, and today was bright and clear, only wisps of clouds overhead and the air less muggy than it had been on the hike to Pattering Hill. Pakana and Pana had seen them off with many thanks, and more importantly to Lucy's mind, many gifts. Now each of the siblings wore a sturdy pack, with food for several days and spare blankets, and Pakana had even given Peter a flask of wine. Rhea had twitched an ear at that, and Lucy had resolved to ask her later what that meant. Now the wolf gave her equivalent of a shrug and said, Some fear, I believe, but I was not taught much Nanian history as a cub. The witch outlawed it, and the penalties were severe. I wonder why, said Edmund. Why what? asked Lucy, adjusting her back. It was better than the bedroll, and even had a waist belt, but it was still hot and sticky against her back. Edmund chewed his lip. Well, she cared. What did it matter what people knew about history if she was in control of the whole country? She was powerful enough to bring down a winter for a hundred years and keep out both Aslan and for the Christmas. Rhea cocked her head, pale waving gently. She'd been a lot nicer to Ed, Lucy had noticed, during the last few days. Well, she wasn't that powerful all at once. Once Queen Swan White was gone, it was still years before the winter settled in for good. That was a queen! asked Lucy. At the same moment, Edmund asked, It took her years! From behind them, Susan laughed. You too! She said affectionately. She still looked worn from her swim in the tunnels, and she had to be shaken awake that morning. But she seemed much better than the day before. Well, it's important, Sue, said Edmund, and then they came around a turn in the trail, and many things happened all at once and very quickly. Peter was in the lead, as usual, and Lucy nearly walked into him because he had stopped in the middle of the path. She heard a growl rising into a roar, and Peter shouted, Get back! and leapt forward, drawing Reen Don from the sheath on his back. Rhea spun around and threw her body against Lucy, shoving her back down the trail. What is it? Lucy cried, but then she saw past Peter the green skin and misshapen shoulders and heard the howl. It was an ogre, one of the fiercest and strongest of the White Witch's henchmen. The ogre swung an enormous axe at Peter, who dodged away, ducking as it spun past his head. Edmund had drawn his sword as well and pushed past Lucy, but Rhea snarled, No, no, there's not enough room. Let the king work. And the wolf was right. The ogre had come upon them in a narrow spot on the trail, with a rock ledge to one side and a thicket of pines to the other. Another fighter in that tight space would merely interfere with the others. But while Edmund could not help, Susan could. She strung her bow with smooth, unhurried movements, and within seconds had lit an arrow fly and put another to the string. The first did no damage, hitting the ogre's boiled leather holberg at an angle and flying off into the brush. The ogre didn't even notice and lunged at Peter, who evaded him again. But this time Peter dashed closer and, swinging wildly, wounded him on the upper arm. Green blood flowed freely, and the ogre howled in pain. Peter danced back out of range, and Susan shot again. This arrow did it miss and struck the ogre square in the shoulder. The ogre tore the point out and flung it away, roaring, and then threw himself at Peter, not even using the great axe. With an agility Lucy found shocking, Peter stepped to the side and swung Rindon upwards, catching the tip in the ogre's throat as it passed. Lucy gasped as the blood spurted too fast for her to look away. The ogre took another step forward, turning towards Peter, and then with nothing more than a gurgle, he collapsed to the ground, and green blood spread out onto the dirt around him. There was a silence after the howling was over. Even the wind in the trees had stopped, and all Lucy could hear was the pounding in her ears. She looked at the ogre sprawled on the trail. He was much larger than any human, but not giant-sized. He wore torn black breeches and a ragged brown cloak over his leather holberg, and appeared to have no other belongings. Even his feet were bare. She wondered if he had been in the battle and was running away, if he had been as afraid of the Pavinces as Lucy was of him. She wondered if he had a family and realized that, of course, everyone did. Even the White Witch had had parents once. Lucy had only seen the very end of the battle and had been high in the tree when Peter killed Mulgrim. This, this death, this battle was sudden and terrifying, sharp as the knife Father Christmas had given her. 
and frightening to realize that Aslan had sent them to Narnia to kill. Pete, are you all right? Edmund pushed past Rhea, resheathing his sword. Peter met him, and they clasped hands as though they had not seen each other for days, and then Peter tried to wipe his sword on Edmund's shirt, and they laughed. Boys, sighed Susan, and unstrung her bow. Lou, will you help me find those arrows? This is not a magical quiver, I'm afraid. Careful, queen, cautioned Rhea. I do not smell any others, but the wind is behind us. After a careful search, which produced only one of Susan's red-feathered arrows, they continued on up the valley, now speaking in soft voices and traveling more cautiously. The witch's army might have been defeated, but Rhea said that many of them had fled west and north into the wild lands. Where there was one ogre, there might be more. In the mid-afternoon, after a lunch of dried fish and crumbly cakes made of grain and seaweed, they heard voices ahead, and Peter motioned Rhea forward to investigate. She reappeared a few minutes later with a jaunty tail. Nothing to worry about, she said, and so they followed her down the path into a great copse of berry bushes. Instead of monsters or who knows what, Lucy was charmed to see half a dozen fawns with coats of brown gold or black picking berries in a clearing next to the stream. Why, it's humans! cried one of them, dropping his basket, and they all gathered around to welcome the siblings. Barely five minutes later, Lucy found herself sitting in a circle on a sunny spot of grass eating brimbleberries, which grow only in northwest Narnia during the height of summer and make lovely pies, and attempting to talk with the fawns about politics. To be fair, it was mostly her siblings who talked about politics. The fawns were as uninterested in the subject as Lucy herself was. Were any of you at the battle? Peter asked, and two fawns, somewhat reluctantly, said they had been, while the others looked either uncomfortable or bored. Peter shared a glance with Susan, and she picked up the conversation. Tell me, where do you all live? Do you have families? Susan was always good at this sort of conversation, and the fawns merrily replied, tripping over each other's words. The eldest of the fawns was a burly fellow named Vernus, who was a bit more well-spoken than the rest. Lucy was beginning to realize that Tumnus was probably something of an aristocrat among fawns. None of these fawns seemed likely to own any books or tea service. There are some right smart caves down the valley, Furness said, looking quite pleased with himself. Even during the winter they stayed warm, though it was hard sometimes to get enough fuel for the fires. And why is that? Edmund asked. Rhea rolled her eyes and Edmund flushed, but looked less annoyed than he would have several days ago. Well, the dryads, you know, said Furness. You can't take live wood, after all, and there wasn't much immature wood to speak of during the winter. This baffled all the provinces, and after some questioning and confusion, Lucy finally had an answer for a question that had been bothering her. How could people light fires and build with wood in a land where the trees had spirits? And the explanation, as much as she could follow it, was that the spirit of a dryad grew slowly as a tree matured, so that saplings had no dryads, and many or most trees, especially if they were damaged or diseased or simply boring, never grew a spirit at all. But only the dryads themselves knew which mature trees were safe to chop down, so anyone else had to be very careful to harvest only young or obviously diseased trees. I see said Susan at the end of Vernus's complicated explanation, which had been interrupted and corrected repeatedly by the other fawns. So if someone wished to build a house out of wood, for example, one would have to negotiate with the dryads to identify which trees would be available for that. You've got that right, girl, said Vernus, and beamed at her in approval. At which point, one of the two fawns who had been at the battle blinked and said, Oh, you're Iceland, humans, the kings and queens! He jumped up and bowed to them. And if you have never seen a fawn with his goat legs bow, it is an awkward sight. Kings and queens! cried the other fawns, and they had to jump up and bow as well, and Peter stood up and bowed back, and so the rest of them did too. Lucy found herself embarrassed by the berry stains on her tunic, which was silly because she had been perfectly comfortable with the fawns two minutes before. When the bowing was over and they had all sat down again, Peter asked, So what will you do now that the winter is over? The fawns just stared at him. No, it drink and dance, of course said Vernus, as if it were obvious. That's lovely, said Lucy, and meant it. Everyone was so serious since the coronation. At least the fawns remembered how to have a nice time. Peter's eyes crinkled, and Ed grinned straight at Lucy, but not in the old mean way. And what will you eat? asked Susan. Besides these lovely berries, of course. She took another handful, somehow managing to eat them without staining her fingers. Lucy decided that food that reminded you you'd eaten it half an hour later was more fun, and dug her hand deep into the berry basket. Nuts and vegetables, said Vernus, and 
Fish from the river, said another fawn, and honey from the trees, said a third. Do you need anything else? Edmund asked, although from his voice he didn't expect much of an answer. Yes, said Vernus to everyone's surprise. All our vines die during the winter, and without vines there are no grapes to make wine. We need cousins, good kings and queens. His companions agreed, drumming their hooves on the ground in a thunderous beat that made Lucy want to dance. Peter put his chin in his hand. Cuttings for grapevines, he repeated thoughtfully. Where would they come from? He asked. Werner stared. Why, Gallerman King! Or, well, perhaps Southern Archer Land. It's too cold in Galma, and even here we may only plant on the south face and hillsides. Of course, said Susan faintly. Gallerman or the Lone Islands. Why didn't we think that? Well, you have a lot on your minds, no doubt, being kings and queens now, said Vernus kindly. The rest of the fawns agreed, nodding with enthusiasm. At length, after a conversation that carried on for some time, but covered no new ground, Rhea cuffed and stretched, yawning so widely that her tongue curled out over her white teeth. It's time to move on, King, she said quietly to Peter. I would like to be over the ridge before we camp. There are too many insects along the stream. Why are you gone? asked Vernus. Northwest, answered Peter with a nod up the valley. Vernus looked startled and a bit worried. Lucy noticed. You're going to see Stormcoat's people. They don't like visitors much, he warned. They won't hurt you, he added hurriedly. But they stick to themselves. You'll see. And that was all the fawns would say. They made their farewells and returned to their berry picking, while the Pevensies followed Rhea along the path next to the chuckling stream. More of a creek now, Lucy realized. It ran silver and sparkling through and over gray stones and gravel green with moss. The wind whipped green leaves across its merry surface. Calamon? Galma? Archon land? asked Susan, stepping over a branch across the path. Lucy added, On the Lone Islands. She liked the name. She wondered if they were pretty and if they had palm trees or penguins. Peter groaned. Lion's mine, he said. We're going to have to learn about foreign relations. Ed, it's your watch. Peter's voice hissed in Edmund's ear and he groaned and rolled over, trying to hide his head under his pillow. Except he had no pillow, just something lumpy and hard. His fumbling hand hit something else closing around it and he realized it was the scabbard of his sword. Sword. Narnia. Watch. Oh, right, it was his watch, because there were ogres and werewolves and hags out there, and wolves needed more sleep than humans did, and Lucy was too young. A point she had challenged and been overruled on. Just now, sitting up on his uncomfortable bedroll with the stars still bright overhead, Edmund wished he, too, were too young to keep watch. All right, I'm up, I'm up, he said to Peter, who whispered, Keep quiet, will you? He whirled over, pushed himself up, and picked up his sword. Peter didn't say another word, just collapsed into Edmund's blankets. After a few seconds, Edmund nudged Peter's leg. Peter didn't react at all. He looked around. It was cooler than it had been. The air had a hint of chill, as if warning that autumn was coming, and he wondered if it was, if Aslan's summer was shortening, as they had expeculated. He shrugged his cloak over his shoulders and tried to walk around the campsite, looking for anything dangerous, but he saw nothing but the darkness and nearly tripped over a log himself. Finally, Edmund sat down on a large boulder and stared up at the stars. They were enormous, bright and large, as if closer than the stars in England. Edmund didn't know the stars very well, although he knew that he ought to. Still, he thought these constellations were not the ones he would have seen from the back garden in Finchley. One of them, he guessed, was probably the North Star, or a North Star. He wondered if Rhea would know, if he asked, or if she would just roll her eyes at him again. They had lit a fire for their dinner, and although it had died down, there were still a few coals glowing. Edmund poked at them with a stake until one of them brightened and flames licked at the unburnt wood. Rhea probably still thought of him as a traitor, not like Peter, who was a great warrior, or Susan, who was a hero to everyone, the way she had saved the dwarves, even though Edmund was the one who came up with the plan in the first place. He rubbed his hands on his arms and huddled closer to the fire. It was so cold. It wasn't fair. The coldest time of night was always just before morning. Why did he have to be on watch now? Besides, it was obvious nothing was going to happen. Edmund put another stick on the fire. Peter and Susan were both warm in their blankets, and Lucy didn't even have to keep watch at all. 
Edmund was the one who was solving problems for everyone else and actually thinking about things, they were probably still punishing him, even though he'd fought as hard against the witch as anyone and nearly died, even. He wished... He wished... The little flame he was staring at flared up suddenly, a flicker of gold and heat and a breath of sweetness against his face, as though he were out on that hillside again, the great lion speaking to him in that voice as deep and joyful as the earth itself. Emmon flushed and jumped to his feet, letting the shame wash away the resentment that he had been clinging to. The others weren't really punishing him, and Rhea had been much nicer to him the last few days. And, oh, how he hated being horrible! It made the world a horrible place, too! Who could bear to be horrible in Narnia, which was so beautiful and had dwarves and fawns and centaurs, oak gods and griffins? Edmund was just congratulating himself for breaking out of his funk, with possibly some help from Aslan, when he looked up at the trees around them to see that the dawn light had begun to fill the sky, and to see that the campsite was surrounded by heavily armed centaurs, all of whom were pointing spears at Edmund. Peter was rather unsurvable about the whole thing. The point of being on watch, Ed, is that you watch. Sentries get drummed out for falling asleep at the post, you know. I wasn't, Edmund protested as they scrambled up a steep hillside after the centaurs. They were not, after all, prisoners. Mentioning Aslan put a stop to anything like that right away. But Windcaller felt it necessary that they meet Stormcoat in person, and since Windcaller had come visiting with six of his brethren, each of whom outweighed all the Pevensies together, off they went. Rhea paused in front of Edmund, looking not at all as though she were halfway up a mountainside, and Edmund envied her those four legs to his two. Fire kills night vision, young king. There was a reason we banked it at sunset. With that, she dug in her claws and shot on the top of the rise, knocking loose dirt and gravel behind her as she went. Oh! said Peter from behind it, and they couldn't keep from laughing. It wasn't for several minutes that he realized Rhea had called him king for the first time. Lucy had a harder time than the rest of them climbing up the steep trail, and they stopped at the summit to wait for her and Susan. By the time the girls reached the top, they were red-faced and sweaty, but it hadn't stopped Lucy's tongue. Something, don't you see? Swiping an arm across her face, Susan said, No, I don't. See if Edmund understands you. Lucy gave Edmund an enthusiastic look. The trees couldn't spread in the winter, could they, because of the cold? So now there's lots and lots of saplings everywhere, like the fawn said. Everyone is having children. Children? Asked Peter dryly, and Lucy blushed, but soldiered on regardless. Well, they are dryads, Peter, so their children are trees. I'll follow you so far, new, but what's your point? Edmund asked, aware that the centaurs were beginning to stamp their feet impatiently. They had been relatively polite so far, but he didn't want to press that courtesy. Lucy stared at him and then flung both arms outwards, indicating the entire area around them. They were at the summit of a rise in the woods, on a path that led on and upwards, Edmund noted dolefully, through yet more trees. Edmund looked around as Lucy indicated, then looked more closely. There were no saplings here, only mature trees. It looked a bit like a farm, except the trees were all different types, and they were all fully adult, and therefore, Edmund realized, of an age to have, or be, dryads. Huh, he said, and Lucy nodded in enthusiastic agreement. You see? And what's more, the dryads here are all very quiet. None of them will come out and talk to me at all. I think they're afraid, or maybe angry. Edmund and the others stared at her. Lucy flushed again. Don't you talk to the trees, too? Stormcoat's home wasn't like any dwelling place Edmund had ever seen before. Instead of a house or a cave or a castle, the Sendars of the North Reaches lived in a large open area bounded by a number of three-sided sheds. The open space was mostly trampled dirt, with stone hearths and ovens spaced at even intervals, and a few tall tables next to them. Inside the sheds were bundles and baskets, and Edmund realized they were to protect the centaur's belongings from the weather, even though they were too small to fit more than the smallest centaur infants inside. Several dozen centaurs were busy here. Some appeared to be cooking at the fireplaces, one was lecturing to a group of younger centaurs, and a number of youths were practicing with spears at the far side of the meadow. Some distance to the north, the land rose into a series of open hills on which Edmund spotted the shape of some sort of cattle, or maybe sheep. He wondered if they talked, too. 
The Pevensies and Rail were escorted into the center of the space, where water bubbled in a finely carved stone fountain and flowed away in a narrow channel confined by good stonework. Next to the fountain, which was shaped like a winged horse, stood the largest centaur Edmund had ever seen. Stormcoat was a majestic figure, the skin on his human body dark as ink, while his horse body was mottled gray with black spots. His hooves were the size of dinner plates, and he stamped them as the Pevensies approached, his tail whipping across his haunches once before stilling. What found you in the woodwind collar? Stormcoat asked, and his voice matched his size, deep and powerful. They say they come from Aslan, sire, said Windcaller, with a deferential nod. We found them camped on the ridge off the Black Oak Trail. Stormcoat peered at them, squinting through the tangled mess of black hair that hung almost to his shoulders. Looking around, Edmund noticed that only Stormcoat looked so ungroomed. The other centaurs kept their hair braided or bound, and he even saw one older male, who was nearly white on his hindquarters, with no hair at all on his head. "'Are you sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, then?' rumbled Stormcoat. "'Human Cyrenania. These are powerful sights.' Lizzie made a noise like a stifled snort, and Edmund seized her hand in this. "'Ow!' she muttered, but stopped talking when Stormcoat bent his dark gaze on her. Edmund resisted the urge to step in front of her. They were surrounded by armed centaurs, and if their spears mostly had stone tips, Edmund was sure they were still sharp enough to cut. Very powerful, Lord Stormcoat, agreed Peter smoothly. And yes, we are humans, and we were called here by Aslan's favor to help break the White Witch's winter. Jadis is gone, and Narnia is restored to her people. That explains much that I have seen in the stars, said Stormcoat as the centaurs around them stirred and murmured. Aslan has freed Narnia and the witch is gone. We are released from the bondage of winter. What will you do now? Susan asked. She turned as she said it, throwing the questions to all of the assembled centaurs. Now that the witch is gone and Narnia is free? Stormcoat looked at her and then raised his eyes to the clear sky beyond them. We shall do as we always have done. Worship Aslan, raise our children, tend our herds. Edmund was getting a feeding. Not a bad feeling, but an uncomfortable one. He was missing something. He glanced over at Rhea, whose ears were twitching uncertainly, her hackles just the slightest bit raised. Well, said Peter a little awkwardly, perhaps you would consider sending some of your people to Caparavel or to Baruna in two months' time. It's time to start organizing some public defense and reestablish trade relations outside Narnia, don't you agree? Black brows drew down over dark eyes as Stormcoat looked at Peter for a long moment. Then he shrugged and turned away, his tail whipping once. He paced off toward the practice field, his huge feet kicking up dust with every step. "'You are welcome guests in Aslan's name,' said Wincaller, his voice much lighter than Stormcoat's. He hesitated, as though he wanted to say something else, and then he shut his mouth and turned to follow his chief, accompanied by the rest of his patrol." Most of the other centaurs drifted away at that point as well, leaving the Pevensies and Rhea standing alone in the middle of the village. Peter looked flummoxed. Well, that went well, said Edmund and sat down on the edge of the fountain. I suppose you could have done better, asked Peter, but there was no venom in it. He just seemed frustrated. Edmund shook his head. I don't see how. They don't seem very interested in us. No, said Lucy, looking thoughtfully after Stormcoat. The only thing they're interested in is Aslan. Susan sat down next to Edmund and put her hand in the water flowing out of the fountain. The light north wind blew her hair into her face, and she tucked it behind her ear absently. Lucy's right. It's like the, oh, a monastery or something. Hermits living in the wilderness. Remember what Recald said about the stone tools? Look around. There were no metal pots on the stoves, only clay. No jewelry or ornamentation of any kind on any of the centaurs, even the women. The women were all modestly covered with leather or fur vests, although Edmund remembered centaur women from the battle who had gone bare-chested until it was time to arm themselves. And all of the weapons they had seen were stone, finely chipped stone, but stone nonetheless. Peter folded his arms and kicked at the dusty ground, sending a stone skittering into the creek. Well, what are we supposed to do then? Edmund shrugged, then grinned at his brother. He was beginning to realize the advantages of being the younger sibling. You're not a king, you'll think of something, 
The water from the fountain was sweet and cool. Susan took another drink from her cupped hands and then let the water fall away to the dry ground, wiping her hands against her skirt. Well, she said, looking around at the others. What now? Maria cocked her head at Peter. Edmund just grinned, refusing responsibility for any decision-making. And Lucy looked thoughtful. They all, of course, looked at Peter, who huffed in frustration and sat down on the rim of the fountain next to Edmund. I don't know, he said. Sue, so what do you think? For the first time since they had left Caraparavel, he looked truly uncertain. Susan looked around at the centaurs on the practice fields and working at the stone hearths and the lowering hills to the north, bare and threatening. I suppose it's too much to hope for that we should win over everyone right away, she said finally. We should move on and come back another time. It was the pragmatic thing to say, although she was quite sure Peter wouldn't listen to it. Folding his arms across his chest, Peter nodded, and then cocked an eyebrow at Edmund. Well, Ed? Edmund let his smile fall away and drummed his fingers on the fountain for a bit. I think these centaurs are too powerful to leave behind us without some sort of agreement. Sorry, Sue. She shrugged. Peter had asked, and Edmund had answered. Lucy? Peter asked. Susan was startled, but she covered it. Lucy had as much right to an opinion as any of them. Lucy looked off across the fields to the hills, then back at Peter. I think we should trust Aslan and be patient. It was, Susan suspected, exactly what Peter had wanted to hear. Well, it was neither the first nor the last time practicality had lost to optimism. She wouldn't let it weigh her down. She was a queen, after all. They all waited while Peter considered their options. I think we should stay he finally said, and not just because of Stormcoat's people. Freya, how far are we from the border here? You are on it, king, said the wolf. Well, nearly. Those hills mark the border, more or less. I couldn't tell you exactly where it is, though I'm sure Stormcoat knows. But is his border Narnia's border? asked Edmund, and no one answered him. They ate a lunch of dried fish, cooked into a mushy stew with fresh greens, followed by a bowl full of brimbleberries. The centaurs at the hearth nearest them let them borrow a pot and bowls, and while the Provincies ate their salty stew, Susan saw Edmund leaning sideways to watch the centaurs at their meal. What is it? she asked, since she couldn't see what he was looking at without turning all the way around herself. He shoveled a spoonful of stew into his mouth, grimaced around it, and swallowed before he answered. They're eating hay! They have a great pile of hay, and they're eating that as well as fruit and meat from a bowl. Rhea nosed at her empty bowl with evident discontent. Well, they do have two stomachs, King, a horse's stomach and a man's, so they must eat the proper food for both. It must have been very hot for them during the winter, Susan suggested. Rhea nodded. Many centaurs died in the first years of the witch's reign, and it is said more fled west and south into other lands. Not north? asked Lucy. North is giant territory, replied Rhea, her ears going back. No one would hope for refuge there. Susan looked again at the rugged hills to the north and wondered how far away the giants were. But Giant Rumblebuffin is nice, protested Lucy. Then he is a very unusual giant queen, Rhea said. For nearly all our history, Narnia has been at war with the giants of the northern mountains. Lucy looked unhappy at this, but subsided. Susan breathed a quiet sigh of relief. So we'll know, asked Edmund. I don't think there's any point in following Stormcoat around and telling him how Aslan appointed us kings and queens. That's not the sort of thing he cares about. I think you're right about that, said Peter. But there is something we can do, and we should do, in fact. Come on, and bring your sword. Which is how Susan found herself watching her brothers practice swordplay, fairly poorly, on the practice field where the young centaurs were training. It was, she realized, a clever idea, because very shortly they had a small audience, among whom was the centaur's weapons master, a stocky mare named Silversharp. No, no, said Silversharp after Edmund had dropped his sword for the second time. She stamped twice, and the boys looked at her in surprise. Those forms are centaur forms, meant for someone with much more height and reach than you. You should be using dwarf forms, or something closer to that. Oh, said Peter, and bowed to the weapons master. We don't know any dwarf forms. Would you be able to teach us? We would be most grateful. Silver Sharp snorted, and Susan could nearly see her eyes roll. Very well, but you must do exactly as I say. I will have no sons of Adam injure themselves in my training. Queen, said Rhea as Silver Sharp began manhandling the boys into better positions. 
There is a set of targets down the field if you two wish to practice. She glanced at the sword blade and twitched an ear. Your brothers will be some time with her, I believe. I'm very sore at the end of it, giggled Lucy. Susan, while you shoot, I want to go talk to the trees some more. Susan wasn't sure she wanted Lucy wandering alone here. The centaur seemed friendly enough, but... She looked down at Rhea, and the wolf waved her tail in acknowledgement. I will stay with her, queen. Lucy looked for a moment as though she would protest, but Susan gave her a hard look, and instead she smiled merrily. Let's go, Rhea. I think that grove over there is the best place to start. She ran off at once, the wolf bounding along behind her. The practice field was a large area, of necessity for centaurs take up a lot of space, and Susan walked slowly down to the end of the muddy field, watching young centaurs spar and tumble with one another. At the end was a set of targets and a stance about 100 yards apart. Susan looked at this distance and wondered if she was about to embarrass herself. A handful of centaurs were at the butts, mostly young ones, and one grizzled elder with a beard he has separated into a dozen narrow braids, each tied off with a red bead. It was quite a striking look against his dark skin and graying coat. He grunted at Susan as she came up to join them, but said nothing. His young students watched Susan out of the corner of their eyes as she strung her bow and hooked her quiver on her belt. She had used Father Christmas's bow but once in the battle, and only a few times since then. This would be her first chance to really see how good she was with it at a distance. She fell into a rhythm then, concentrating on her aim, the tension in the bow, the power in her arms and shoulders as she drew back, the breath of wind against her cheek just before she loosed. At the end of two dozen shots, she waited until no one else was shooting and then went down to the targets to retrieve her arrows. Her aim was better than she had expected. Almost half of her shots had landed in the target, even at this range, and some of those were in the center. When she came back to the stands, the archery instructor addressed her directly. You're too straight onto the target, girl. Line your feet up so. And he drew a line in front of her so that she stood at a right angle to the target. He watched her closely as she drew, breathed, and released, and reached for another arrow before the first had landed. Better, he said after she shot five more and turned back to his students. It was better. Susan shot five full quivers of arrows and even tried shooting with the other hand, although her aim that way was much poorer. Her fingers had begun to ache and her arms to tremble when there was a shout in the distance. She'd heard shouts and cries all morning from the centaurs training on the practice field, but this was different. It was the sound of someone in great distress. She saw, coming from the hills to the north, two centaurs running hard, galloping so fast that they threw up great muddy clumps of dirt behind them. They looked thin, light-boned, like the other youngsters around her. Susan guessed they were probably shepherds who had gone up into the hills with the herds after the new grass. As they approached, Susan realized one of them was injured. He clutched one arm to his chest, and there was blood on his hindquarters. They galloped past the archery butts and towards the center of the village. Susan unstrung her bow and set out after them at a quick jog. She saw her brothers among the centaurs also coming in from the training grounds. By the time Susan reached the area around the fountain, she couldn't see anything, as it appeared nearly every centaur in the tribe was gathered. However, a human is rather smaller than the average centaur, and she was able to weave her way through the crowd to the front, where she found Peter and Edmund as well. The injured centaur, kneeling on the ground so his wound could be treated, was a young stallion with fair skin and a bay coat. His uninjured companion was a mare, her red-brown hair windblown. "'In the meadows past Dullwater Creek,' she was saying to Stormcoat, her voice shaky with emotion. "'Hud then?' Stormcoat asked, his face expressionless. "'The heart split!' Some following the red ew, she said. Patchfoot and I followed them, leaving Strongwind, Startail, and Valadark with the rest of the herd. We followed the sheep up the dale, and one of the ewes had got trapped in a crevice. It took us a long time, too long, to free her. When we returned to the meadow, the giants were already gone. She gasped, tears running down her face. Stormcoat said nothing, merely folded his arms and waited until she recovered her composure. Half the herd was gone, and Veladark was dead. His body... Oh, Aslan. His body carved like meat for the fire, butchered like the sheep. Silversharp spoke, then her voice fierce. And the other child? What if Strongwind done her full? The young centaur merely choked, shaking her head in distress. Finally, she said, Gone, mistress. Gone. Gone.
A hubbub broke out, centaurs shouting, stamping their feet, thrusting their stone-tipped spears into the air in rage. This went on for several minutes, while Stormcoat stood quiet at the center of it all, his arms folded and his head bowed. Finally, he lifted his head, and although he said nothing, his silence seemed to spread outwards until the tribe too was silent and the air thick with tension. The atmosphere felt oppressive and hot, as though a storm were building, though the sky was clear and a light breeze was playing with the centaur's tails. Susan put her hand out and Peter seized it in a strong grip. She saw he was clutching Edmund's shoulder with his other hand, as if to hold them there in place with him. And such was the energy in that place it felt as though she could fly away on it right up into the air, if not tethered by her brother. The silence held them all for a dozen breaths, and then another dozen, and then Stormcoat spoke. Aslan has freed us from the witch's winter, but he has left the giants for us because he has made us strong. The winter has made us strong and fast and deadly, and there will be no feasting in Galthung tonight. Feasting! Susan realized with a roiling stomach that Stormcoat was not being metaphorical. Strongwind and her foal had been captured to be eaten by the giants like the sheep they had stolen. It, said Peter quietly as Stormcoat began to give orders and the crowd dispersed around them to make ready. Go get up bed rolls and as much food as we can carry. Edmund nodded, his face pale and tight, and Susan could see the excitement thrumming through him as if he had not just spent several hours in Zordblade. But as he turned to go, Susan reached out and seized him by the arm, yanking him to a stop. Something was terribly wrong, something more than the giants and the centaurs' planned attack. Susan looked around them at the dozen or so centaurs now gathered closely around stormcoats and silver sharp counting out arrows, and a male centaur with red hair and freckles leaping into his hands. So many people, so much going on about them. Susan, what? began Edmund, but Susan turned to look at her brothers and she felt her face twist with horrified fear. What is Lucy? she demanded. Peter blinked. She's not with you? Susan shook her head. No, she went off with Rhea to talk to the dryads. Well, she should be all right then, said Edmund. Most of the trees are well south of the border. It was exactly the logical sort of thing Peter wanted to hear, except a flash of movement caught his eye and he felt the blood rim from his face. I don't think so, Ed, he said, and then Rhea was bursting into the plaza, her ears back and her tongue hanging loose as she raced toward him. King Peter, she gasped as she came to a shuddering stop, kicking up dirt with her claws. Susan took a shocked step backwards, but Rhea's attention was entirely on Peter. Peter looked at Rhea and passed her into the bustle of centaurs readying for battle. Lucy was nowhere to be seen. Wolf, he said, and his hand was on his sword hilt. Where is our sister? The trees took her, Rhea said and dropped her head low. They caught her up and carried her away into the forest high in their branches. I chased them for some time, but I could not keep up, and so I came to bring you word. She rolled over, exposing her throat to him once again, as she had the day they had met. Peter stared at her for a long moment, his hand clenching and loosening on Rindon, while the wind ruffled the pale fur on Rhea's underside. A poor king I would be, he said finally, forcing the words out, for all that he knew they were true. Were I to punish one who brings me such news? Rise, Rhea, and tell us all you know. He felt Edmund relax minutely beside him, and didn't let himself wonder what Edmund had been expecting. There was no time for that. Rhea Rose drank deeply from the fountain and told the story, which was simple enough. Lucy had led them further and further into the trees, always heading south and downhill into denser forest. Finally, she stopped and sat on the floor amidst the forest duff and simply started talking. Meaningless things, mostly, said Rhea. She talked about Aslan and your family and her favorite foods. And at last, the dryads began to come out, first the younger ones, the summer girls and boys, and then some of the older ones, too. There were none of the very youngest, and only a few of the elders. They gathered around her, and after she had talked for a long time, they began to ask her questions. Like what? said Susan. She had squatted next to Peter, her bow still in her hands. As Rhea spoke, Susan fingered the fine inlay on the grip of the bow. Who she was, who you were. They had seen us, you see, and they knew we were visiting with the centaurs. And why we were here. Rhea yawned suddenly, and then snapped her jaw closed. Peter suspected this wasn't weariness, but nervousness. Then what happened? Peter asked, 
So far, there seemed no reason for the dryad's attack. Rhea cocked her head. Then one of the summer boys, a tall beach spirit, said, Then you are the queen, and your brothers and sister are kings and queen as well? And Queen Lucy said, Of course, that's what I said. And that's when it happened. Emin leaned forward. That's when they took her away? Faster than I can describe it, my king. The beach boy picked her up and tossed her to one of the young oaks, and away they went into the forest. Lucy called out, and it sounded as though she were arguing, but also laughing, and then they were too far away for me to hear her any more. They moved very fast. She dropped her head again. I am shamed, kings and queen, but I didn't expect such a thing. The dryads are very civil, and while some of them worked for the witch, by and large they venerate Aslan as much as any Nanian does. I have never heard of them having a child or any peaceful Nanian. What will they do to her? Susan asked. She looked very worried, and Peter realized she must have allowed Lucy to go off to talk to the dryads in the first place. Of course she felt responsible for Lucy, but then they all did. They won't hurt her, said Rhea firmly. They wanted something from her, and they didn't take her until they learned what they needed to. The dryads are not warlike. Queen Lucy is in no danger. Peter relaxed a small amount. Surely Rhea wouldn't be so confident if it weren't true. She's a hostage! said Edmund, suddenly sitting up straight. Peter stared at Edmund for a long moment, letting the idea sink in. Against what? Against nothing. They want something from us, corrected Edmund. Something they can only get from the kings and queens of Narnia. But why take her away? Peter began to protest and was interrupted as the butt of a centaur's spear thunked down in front of him. He jumped just a little and was pleased to see he wasn't the only one. We leave now, said Silver Sharp. She had armed herself with three more spears. A heavy mace was slung through a belt around her waist, and she had a bow across her back. Instead of the light vest she had been wearing earlier, she now had a leather curious covering her from shoulders to hips, and a boiled leather helm covered her hair. She looked, if possible, even more warlike and intimidating than she had on the practice grounds. When Peter just stared at her, she thumped her spear down again, and this time Peter felt the impact rattle in his bones. King of Navia, if that is what you are. You people ride your ball, and... Here she shot a glance at Susan. We need more archers. Having conveyed her message, she lashed her tail twice and gandered away. Peter looked at Susan, Edmund, and Rhea. Edmund didn't say anything, and his face was a perfect mask of concentrated neutrality. This was Peter's decision. Peter stood up and brushed the dirt from his breeches, settled Rindon, and nodded to Susan. He wished suddenly for the shield and armor he had left at Care Paraval. He suspected he would need the protection. All right, let's go, he said to Susan. But Susan was not with him. Her dark eyes narrowed. She rose as well, her bow in one white-knuckled hand. Peter, we can't, she said, sounding for all the world like she had when they had first come to Narnia. We have to look for Lucy. She was right. They did have to look for Lucy, but they also had to go with Stormcoat. The Dryads will not hurt her he said evenly, hoping the strain wasn't evident in his voice. And uh, we will leave Edmund and Rhea here to find her and bring her back. Hoping Rhea was right. Forced to believe Rhea was right. I'll find her, find out what they want, Sue, said Edmund, his voice as earnest as Peter had ever heard it. Susan still looked mutinous. So Peter stepped closer, bent his head, and said, The giants are going to eat that centaur full. We cannot put Lucy out of their children. And we're not abandoning her. Ed and Rhea will find her. She bit her tongue then, and after a dark and awkward moment, bent her head stiffly. As you will, High King, and swept away towards their packs to pick up another quiver of arrows. If they had not been surrounded by centaurs preparing for battle, Peter would have put his head in his hands and groaned aloud. As it was, he was grateful when Edmund put a hand on his shoulder. Woke up, said Edmund, and gave him a confident smile that didn't hide the concern in his eyes. I promise to find Lucy, if you promise not to get killed by giants. Rhea stood by him, ears back and tail waving gently in support. All by our sister, murmured Peter with a worried look at Susan, who marched past the two boys without looking at either one of them. Edmund snorted, and Peter clapped him on the back before turning to follow Susan. So this must be politics, he thought, and went to join the small crowd of centaurs who were gathering around Silvershar. I don't think I like it very much. Oh, Aslan, he asked later as Windcaller's muscles bunched and surged under him, driving them further into the darkening hills. Please take care of them, 
and he couldn't at that moment have said exactly who he meant.